Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Arizona Health Chat today. I'm just going to leave a couple minutes for um, anyone else to log in, and then we will get started. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today for our Arizona Health Chat for the month of May. Um, this month's topic, we're focusing on women's health, and we have a wonderful guest speaker today who's going to share some information with everyone about um, types of cancers that commonly affect women, risk factors, um, and some other, other facts about cancer in women. So we're very glad to have you all with us today. And I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, um, Dr. Cynthia Lynch. Um, she's the director of the breast program at Cancer Treatment Centers of America here in Phoenix. Um, so just a couple of logistical information. After the presentation, we will have um, a Q&A session. So if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to type them um, into the chat box and we will go through those questions after uh, Dr. Lynch's presentation. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Lynch. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Amanda and American Cancer Society for inviting me to talk today. Um, about a topic that's very dear to my heart. So I am a, a medical oncologist kind of specializing in breast oncology, but um, definitely a topic that's dear to me is looking at cancers that affect women. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about all kinds of uh, cancers, some that are specific to women, some that are just, you know, not specific to women, but are common in women. And we'll talk about screening and signs of symptoms of things to report to your doctor. So it's going to be a general overview of uh, kind of bouncing on a lot of different topics. Um, but hopefully um, that there'll be a good takeaway about, you know, I think screening is very important. Uh, and that will be a large focus of the talk, uh, primarily because that's something uh, that we know through screening programs where there are screening programs for cancer that uh, that often leads to early diagnosis and early diagnosis also uh, correlates with um, higher rates of cure for those cancers. Um, and in some things, we'll talk about colonoscopy, sometimes it can be even a preventative type procedure. So, um, so we'll kind of go ahead and start. So the first thing I was just gonna look at was what are some of the common cancers that affect women? And then also we'll look at which ones are also the leading cancer deaths. So those are not necessarily the same um, in part because breast cancer is the most common uh, type of cancer among women. However, if you look there on the list, the leading uh, cancer death in women is lung cancer. And that's because of the higher mortality or death rates associated with lung cancer. But for those that most commonly affect women, it's uh, breast, lung and colon in descending order. And then the leading cause of cancer death in women is lung, breast, and colon. And we'll talk a little bit about these um, in particular because uh, these thankfully are all ones that we do have screening programs for. So to start with for breast cancer, as I mentioned, that is the most common type of cancer among women in breast cancer. And I should say that's after skin cancer. So skin cancers are the most common type. Uh, thankfully, a lot of different types of skin cancers um, are very readily curable, um, but breast cancer being kind of the, the second, you know, the most common that we think of beyond those. So um, it is the second most common cause of cancer death, as I stated, and part of that is that even though it is very common, uh, thankfully, we have a lot of very good therapies for breast cancer um, that have led to declining rates of death associated with breast cancer, and one of those things being screening. So when you think of risk factors for breast cancer, it sounds like it would be obvious, but I always tell women, you know, one of the most common risk factors is just being a woman. Um, men can get breast cancer as well. There, and when you look at all the individuals that are diagnosed each year, men make up about 1% of those individuals who will develop breast cancer. So it's not exclusive to women, but definitely that is, you know, that's a strong risk factor. And then age being the second most common risk factor. Uh, we know that as women age, that risk of developing breast cancer goes up. Um, there are other minor risk factors that have some effect there. Uh, one of those can be having uh, the first child after the age of 30. So kind of having a child um, early in life 
actually has somewhat of a protective effect. So having, um, having a child late in life, uh, obesity actually is a risk factor for a lot of different cancers. And we'll kind of touch on that a bit. Um, there's a lot of thoughts as to why obesity might contribute to cancers. Uh, there's some uh, effects having to do with increase in inflammation, that kind of chronic mild inflammatory state that can be associated with obesity, but we do know that is a risk factor for breast as well. Um, also use of, um, I, sorry, I put the initials there, but HRT, hormone replacement therapy. So we know that those can have some effects there. Um, it does depend kind of on the timing of when it's initiated. Sometimes women for um, reasons due to surgery or that sometimes go into an early menopause and are placed on hormone replacement therapy. There is uh, not seen much of a risk associated when women go into an early menopause and are on um, replacement uh, until the natural age of menopause, but it's sometimes you know, used to be many years ago that women would get put on hormone replacement therapy and just stay on it for many, many years. And sometimes no one ever considered, should we discontinue it? Um, but that is now known to be um, a contributor. And so um, just to talk a little bit about signs and symptoms of breast cancer, because they can be quite varied. Sometimes they can be not so obvious uh, changes that you can see. But it's really important when we talk about screening, and I'll try to emphasize that screening means that in an asymptomatic, so someone who's not having any signs or symptoms, there are screening tests. For someone who's having signs or symptoms of a cancer, that always warrants additional um, testing or evaluations beyond just a, a routine screen. So it's really important that if you do have any symptoms, you know, um, not a good idea just to go in and get a screen without letting anyone know that you might be having signs or symptoms because they would potentially want to do additional evaluations. And occasionally things don't show up on a screening study um, and may still warrant further evaluation with say for, you know, symptoms of, uh, you know, changes in the breast might warrant an evaluation with a breast surgeon, even if a mammogram doesn't show anything. So really, really important to be aware of some of these things that you might notice um, that should be reported or discussed with your doctor. So any change in the appearance of the breast, and I say that could be where the skin looks thickened. There might be very fine dimpling where it looks like an orange peel type appearance on the skin. Sometimes even just redness. Redness can be a sign of infection, but also sometimes it can be a sign of uh, breast cancer. And uh, certainly if there was a palpable lump, something that felt abnormal there, abnormal uh, discharge from the nipple, uh, sometimes it can be bloody discharge. Um, also breast pain. I know there's a lot of women, there's a lot of things out there and I've had women who have come in with breast cancer and said they had pain, but they didn't think it could be cancer because you know they know that, um, that cancers don't hurt. What I would say is definitely, you know, it's not the first thing we think of, obviously you wanna rule out other things, but I have definitely seen through the years women who their symptom is a pain in the breast or even a sense of fullness or a heaviness in the breast. Um, so all of those things, what I would say is important to kind of know what's normal for you. And if something seems different and is of concern, those are things that you, know, you should um, bring to the attention of your doctor. So for screening, again, this would be in someone who has no symptoms. Uh, when you look at you know, women, their risk of developing uh, breast cancer for someone who's of average risk is about a 12% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. Um, there are a lot of different recommendations out there for when to start screening. And I'm just gonna touch on them briefly because I do think it's really important for, um, you know, for when you look at screening guidelines, they're all guidelines, which means there should be some conversation. So it's not that, you know, when you come into your doctor, they should just check the box and say, you're this old and this is what you need to have done. Um, there should be a discussion of what the available screening is, what um, your, your history is, what your family history is, as they tailor screening to an individual woman. So that's why I'm going to kind of touch on this. And some groups have different recommendations as to the age to start and how frequent. And unfortunately, I feel like the fact that there are so many different recommendations out there, it's really confused a lot of patients. It's uh, confused a lot of providers. And I feel like it almost has created a hurdle to individuals getting screened because they see conflicting recommendations and then they're just confused and they're not sure what to do. So I think the more important thing is kind of have an idea of what the general recommendations are and then have discussions, you know, discuss these things with your, your uh, you know, primary provider. Um, but so for, in general, most groups will recommend 
starting a discussion of screening for an average risk woman around age 40. Um, usually the consideration is for mammograms on an annual basis. Um, there are some, uh, some out there who will advocate that you could consider on an annual or every two years um, to get that. Uh, there are, for women, there's not really an upper limit of age. There's not an age where we say, um, you know, you no longer need any screening because as we discussed for breast cancer, that risk of developing breast cancer goes up, you know, as you age. So what we look at rather is that if we were to discover something, would this patient, are they healthy enough that we would consider wanting to treat, go through surgery and any other treatments that may follow. And so that's where the recommendation to say, you know, when someone um, is around age 75 or older, you know, you want to assess, do they have other medical problems that is likely to shorten their life where they may not benefit from a screening program um, versus do they have a longer life expectancy where they're very healthy, where we said, absolutely, if we find something, this would be, you know, we want to do all the treatments for this and, um, and it could improve their um, survival. Um, there's different things that we think of when we think of how to screen the breast. Um, one thing out there is, and I put on here, it's uh, basically um, a breast self-exam. And I'll talk to you a little bit because the terminology has changed again. I'm not, I will say I'm not a big proponent of necessarily making things more confusing to patients. I think the simpler, the better. Um, but most people, most women know when you say breast self-exam, what that means, it means kind of examining your breasts. Um, there are some people out there who advocate using the terminology, just an awareness of your breasts. So I'm not sure how you're aware of them without examining them or, you know, and looking at them, knowing what normal feels like to you. But that's what makes, uh, you know, a lot of people feel comfortable more with that terminology saying an awareness. And that just means kind of knowing what's normal for you. And if something seems different uh, to you or something is of concern to bring that to the attention of your, um, you know, your care providers. And then the, the CBE is a clinical breast exam. That means a breast exam being done by um, a clinician. So, you know, you might think of going to your gynecologist once a year where they do a breast exam. So that's kind of an example of a clinical breast exam. So there are concerns, you know, I would say I don't see a lot of harm in uh, women kind of having a knowledge of what is normal for them. Um, you know, some individuals have uh, raised the concern that, you know, it's hard, sometimes it's hard, even when I'm examining, you know, the reason why we do imaging is because we might feel something and say, you know, this could be of something concern, we need to do further evaluations. Sometimes when women are examining themselves, it's even harder because you have less of that experience to know what kind of, uh, what are the things that we're looking for. But I think it, it's always, it's never a bad thing if there's something that you're concerned about to bring that to someone's attention. As I mentioned, Early diagnosis is so important, improving um, cures uh, that, you know, there is no reason no one should feel worried about bringing that up to their provider or think, I don't want to bother them. This is probably nothing. It's always better to evaluate it and make sure it's nothing of concern. So um, the other thing is, so mammograms, and that's when I was talking about the different ages starting around age 40. Um, mammography has been, you know, around for a long, long time, and it still remains kind of our favored screening tool. Um, breast ultrasounds are sometimes used typically more commonly as opposed to them being used as a, a way to screen the entire breast. Most of the time when we're using a breast ultrasound, it's because of something, maybe, um, something that we can feel abnormal on exam. Sometimes it's something that is found on a mammogram where they do a very specific ultrasound just to look in that area, um, to see, um, if there's something that is abnormal, that what you're feeling, uh, correlates with what we're seeing on ultrasound. Breast MRIs are another way to screen um, the breast. These are typically used in women who are at very high risk of developing breast cancer. And so um, what's considered very high risk, because there are tools out there where you can enter information about yourself, about your family history that can predict, are you at higher risk than the average a person of developing breast cancer, maybe because of findings that you've had on a prior biopsy that weren't cancer, but maybe put you at higher risk, um, or maybe based on um, family history alone. Uh, the reason it's not necessarily recommended for everyone to undergo a, a breast MRI is that we do know that it's much more sensitive in picking up breast cancers, but women who are being screened with breast MRIs, unfortunately, will go undergo many more biopsies than women who are undergoing screening with mammogram alone. 
and a fair number of those will be negative biopsies. So meaning we would be sampling a lot more, but not finding cancer as frequent. And so that's why it's best suited to use a very sensitive tool like breast MRI in someone who's at higher risk, where it may be appropriate to be doing more of those biopsies. Um, I did just want to touch on dense breast tissue because this is another point of confusion for a lot of individuals, including, um, you know, providers. So doctors sometimes, you know, primary care providers sometimes get confused as to what they should do when they see dense breast tissue reported on a mammogram. So to explain dense breast tissue, um, what that kind of looks like or what that can do is I always give the example of at least, so I'm here in Arizona we have very little clouds in the sky. So almost every day when we go outside, you can see the moon in the sky. But a lot of other places I've lived where there's a lot of clouds in the sky, you look outside, you just see clouds and you can't see the moon because it's kind of hidden in that cloud. And that's how, what dense breast tissue can do. Um, if there's a cancer in the breast, you kind of get almost like this whiteout from the density of the breast tissue. And it can make it a little harder to find cancers in and the uh, breast where it's dense breast tissue. Women who are very young um, have very dense breast tissue. Actually over, as women age, um, that breast tissue becomes fatty replaced and it actually becomes a little bit easier to see cancers in uh, the breast tissue where it's become less dense. Um, so it's very common in young women. That's in part why when we're screening, you know, we don't screen very young women. Um, sometimes even when young women have abnormalities, we'll kind of jump to other techniques for looking at um, that in addition to the mammogram. Um, the other thing is that we do know that some women with dense breast tissue also have a higher risk. It can be associated with a higher risk of developing breast cancer. So because of that concern that it can make it more difficult to identify um, cancers in the breast, um, there has been, many states have put into place recommendations that if a woman has dense breast tissue, that they will get a letter along with their mammogram that may say your mammogram looks good, but you have dense breast tissue and having dense breast tissue can make it less likely that we can find that cancer in the breast. And so because of that, that cr has created a lot of confusion to say, you know, women get those letters and they feel uncomfortable, like maybe my mammogram wasn't adequate um, and providers get that and they say, I don't know if I should do something either. Um, current standard, because there's been a lot of studies in looking at this, what I would say one thing that's very reassuring is that nowadays, most mammogram centers that are offering mammograms use digital mammography. Um, other terms for that is tomosynthesis or 3D mammography, which means that we're no longer just getting kind of a 2D picture where it's just one shot uh, image of the breast, but actually the radiologist can kind of flip through images, almost like they're looking through slices of the breast. And that type of screening has actually really helped and been helpful in dense breast tissue. And again, most imaging centers are utilizing that type of mammogram. And so that alone can be helpful. Um, but I think the important thing is if someone does have dense breast tissue, it's just even more important for the primary provider to kind of get more information from that patient about their family history, um, if they've ever had any breast biopsies. Because if someone does meet that high risk, so if you're more than an average risk, then the consideration comes, should we be adding in other things? And one of the things that has been looked at is ultrasound. Again, there's some difficulties with doing that, but actually breast MRI, you know, which would be kind of my favorite one in someone who has a high risk for developing breast cancer and maybe has that very dense breast tissue. Um, so it is something that, again, if you see this on your mammogram, it doesn't mean that they've missed something. It just means it can be a little bit harder. Sometimes things can be missed. And to have that discussion with your provider about should I, am I someone who, you know, I'm good with still the mammogram that I had, or do I need a little bit additional screening? So switching gears to cervical cancer, um, if you remember from my the, the list that talked about the most common cancers or the cancers that are um, highest risk uh, for uh, associated with death in women, cervical cancer was not on either of those lists and in part because of excellent screening. And we'll talk a little bit too about um, now even prevention through vaccinations that are available. Um, but cervical cancer, um, it's it's much more common in developing countries where women are not, you know, had traditionally not been undergoing routine screening um, with, say, pap tests. 
Um, it is most commonly associated with a chronic HPV infection. So that human papillomavirus, um, the reason why there are certain types of human papillomavirus that are associated with cervical cancer. And so that's why, you know, and I'll talk a little bit about the prevention with, um, with vaccinations because of the majority of these being associated with that. There are other risk factors, smoking, um, again, obesity, you know, you'll see that, as I mentioned, on the list of a lot of these cancers. So um, really, you know, maintaining a healthy weight and uh, exercise are so, so important. And um, those are things that you can do for yourself to help lower the risk of these cancers. Um, for the U.S., uh, the, the mortality um, associated with cervical cancer has been decreasing since the 1970s. And again, this is in part because of routine screening where you can pick these up very early. Sorry, I just gotta get my. I traveled, I apologize. Um, so for um, cervical cancer screening, as I mentioned, uh, there's a few different ones. So for many, many years, most women are familiar with the PAP test or PAP smear. Um, which uh, had typically many years ago was recommended every year. Um, nowadays, there's uh, data showing that if women have not had any um, abnormal pap smears that you can actually go a little bit longer. So every three years. Um, more recently, there has been that HPV testing. So if you can do that testing to see is that woman have a chronic infection associated with the human papillomavirus that's associated with that. If that's negative, um, then that testing can be done every five years. And then sometimes they use the term co-testing, which is doing a PAP along with testing for the HPV, and that one is every five years as well. Um, so for average risk, again, there's variations out there as to when to exactly start, uh, but average risk is typically recommended somewhere between ages 21 and 25. Um, and again, you can see kind of the frequencies on there. So 21 uh, different, again, different groups have kind of different recommendations as to what they consider the ideal test for the ideal frequency to do that. So some will recommend that pap smear every three years, as long as there's normals. Uh, others will, uh, American Cancer Society included, recommends doing the HPV testing as well. And then that also decreases the frequency if that's negative. Um, currently, there is not a recommendation, I think I touch on a little bit later too, but for individuals who are HPV vaccinated, um, the recommendation is still to follow these standard guidelines, but over time, you know, we may see changes there. Um, it's just too soon to know. Um, and typically women are recommended to continue screening through age 65. After age 65, there can be consideration to discontinue if women had been undergoing routine imaging up until that point, it was felt that they've had adequate sampling, they've never had any abnormalities, then there can be consideration for discontinuing. The, um, so just to mention again, you know, there can be sometimes populations of individuals who are at higher risk of developing cervical cancer. And so, you know, it might make sense um, and I just, but I just want to state that, that if someone falls into a high risk category, that they might be someone who actually needs to follow, you know, a little more intensive screening than what just the guidelines um, have in place. And that could be individuals who are immunosuppressed. It could be through an infection like HIV, or um, we know some women who have been exposed to a substance called DES while they were in utero could be at higher risk too. Um, I often get the question from women, uh, the question about if they've had a hysterectomy and they have removed the cervix, because um, again, when you do a pap test, that's kind of where they're sampling the cervix. Um, so it's looking for cervical cancer. If that cervix has been removed and it wasn't done because of cervical cancer, um, then typically it's felt that women can discontinue screening with um, that pap testing. Um, again, for HPV vaccination, current recommendation is still to follow the standard screening recommendations. Um, so prevention, uh, just to mention, you know, HPV vaccination, um, you know, is something that because we know that there are certain uh, HPV viruses that are associated or higher risk uh, to 
uh, go on to develop cervical cancer, uh, there is uh, now vaccinations that are available. You can kind of see the recommended age group where, you know, it's pediatricians often talking to patients uh, or their parents these days about the HPV vaccination uh, recommended in ages uh, 9 to 12. But then also there's Consideration, obviously, you know, as this is coming newer, there's a lot of children who maybe kind of missed that time frame. So um, should still consider uh, vaccinations in that 13 to 26, and then it's recommended age 27 to 45, just a discussion with the healthcare provider. Um, other things that can be done, uh, that smoking cessation, uh, stopping smoking, because that can be associated. And again, that maintaining a healthy weight. For endometrial cancer, so that's the uterus, you know, so you have the cervix, which we were just talking about with the pap testing, which is, you know, when they do a vaginal exam, kind of what they can see is the cervix, and that's what they're testing on a pap smear. The uterus, however, there is no screening um, in general for your average risk woman for endometrial cancer. I know sometimes women are a little bit confused because they think that that pap smear might be testing for endometrial cancer as well, but in general, well, definitely it is not, that's not what its intent is for. Sometimes uh, you might imagine if someone has a cancer within the uterus, there could be cells. Sometimes one of the signs of that can be vaginal bleeding. So there could be some cells that might be picked up on a pap smear that are abnormal, but it is definitely not an adequate test if someone's having symptoms to rule out if there is endometrial cancer there. So I think, you know, very important, especially in a cancer where there isn't a, a screening available, is to really be aware of what the symptoms are of that so that you can report it early. Because again, as I mentioned, early identification of cancer means higher likelihood of cure. So some of the things, again, obesity is um, associated uh, with endometrial cancer. There can be some medications. So there's medications sometimes uh, using estrogen uh, can do that, um, tamoxifen which um, we use sometimes to treat breast cancer because it looks like estrogen to the uterus that has a risk associated with it. Um, women who have gone, uh, started their menstrual cycles at an early age or went through menopause at a late age, those could be um, potential risk factors associated with that. Uh, but some of the symptoms that I would say most common, so uterine cancers most commonly occur in postmenopausal women, women who've already stopped their menstrual cycle. So really any bleeding, even I say if it's a one-time spotting of vaginal blood after menopause is something that should be reported to your provider because that usually requires additional evaluations. Actually, when they are looking for a uterine cancer, they um, do something called an endometrial biopsy, which is kind of like where they take... Um, where they have to go through the cervix and sample the cells within the uterus. So it requires very specific testing for it if there's abnormalities. But I think it's important to know because sometimes women just have very mild, they might have spotting a few days here or there, and then they don't have anything. They might have it a few more times and then it seems to go away. And in their mind, you know, the problem because they're not still seeing that uh, vaginal bleeding or spotting that they don't need to address it with their provider. But again, Think of it as any vaginal bleeding spotting after menopause is abnormal. Sometimes it can just be due to things like vaginal dryness, um, you know, after intercourse, sometimes women can have it. But again, it's always better to evaluate and make sure, you know, if you're having any of these abnormalities that it isn't anything, um, you know, related to cancer. So better to uh, let your provider know and, and have that evaluated. So also to sometimes abnormal vaginal bleeding where if someone was having pretty routine um, uh, menstrual cycles, but they were having additional bleeding in between. Um, a lot of things can do that, sometimes benign things, but cancer always needs to be ruled out as well. Uh, some individuals do have a strong predisposition um, because of you know, genetic mutations that could put them at risk for developing endometrial cancer. Some of those women are uh, individuals who at a certain age, we even give consideration to once they've had all the, the children that they plan to, to have the uterus removed if they're at very high risk. Um, but you can see here that for some individuals like those who might have Lynch syndrome or another syndrome called HNPCC, which is where they can get a lot of polyps in the, uh, uh, where they can sometimes have polyps in the colon, but also have a high risk of colon cancer. Um, there is a recommendation for those individuals to undergo screening with an endometrial biopsy. So again, um, prevention for this 
uh, diet and exercise are, you know, the big things there. For ovarian cancer, um, that's, I kind of gave a little bit of numbers there as to the, how many um, individuals will be diagnosed with ovarian cancer and deaths related to ovarian cancer each year in the U.S. There is, um, there unfortunately is not routine screening for ovarian cancer either. Um, and part screening has, there has been a lot of attempts at identifying a way, ways to screen individuals. Again, ovarian cancer is one of those types of cancers that sometimes can be associated with a genetic syndrome. So even when they have looked at trying to screen a very high risk population of women, women who they know have a genetic predisposition, unfortunately, screening has not been shown to be able to reduce deaths associated with ovarian cancer. And in part, you know, it's because it's hard to pick up at a very early stage. Um, and that's why screening just has not been very successful. There are sometimes things that are attempted um, for those individuals using ultrasounds and sometimes blood tests, looking at tumor markers. But um, I think it's really important for women to be aware of symptoms, you know, and report those early because uh, again, screening just has not shown a reduction in mortality. Um, so symptoms to report, and they can be very vague. So that's hard, I know, because some of these symptoms come and go. But what I often tell women is that, you know, if you have a symptom here or there, you know, you know, that's not something, you know, you have bloating one day, you know, obviously I'm not saying run to the doctor, you know, to say I had bloating yesterday, but think about if there's this pattern of abdominal bloating or discomfort, sometimes it can be a change in the bowels where sometimes I've seen uh, women with ovarian cancer before who had just, you know, a suddenly change where they had lots of diarrhea or loss of stool. Um, sometimes the shape of the stool may have changed um, where they just have lost their appetite and started losing weight. So again, they're, they're kind of um, things that, you know, everyone has probably experienced before. But again, if you're seeing a pattern of these symptoms, again, very important to get in and get evaluated, um, you know, to rule that out. I would say there's, you know, there's other things that are probably more commonly going to be found when individuals have these complaints, but it's always important and uh, for your doctor to rule out anything that requires special uh, a treatment, um, such as cancers. So lung cancer, kind of switching gears a little bit to two of the cancers that are not specific to women, but are very common among women. So lung cancer, again, is the second most common type of cancer in women, and it is but the number one um, cause of cancer deaths among U.S. women. Uh, smoking is the leading cause of lung cancer. And so obviously one of the main ways we can look at uh, prevention is, you know, avoidance of smoking. Um, if you're already smoking, you know, looking for, uh, you know, assistance in, um, in stopping smoking is the best thing you can do for yourself. Also, secondhand smoke can be really important too. So you think of that exposure where maybe someone you live with is smoking as well. That can be an important contributor to um, lung cancer as well. But it is important to recognize that not all cancers, uh, lung cancers are related to smoking. There are some cancers that we see in what we call never smokers. So someone who's never smoked or maybe hasn't had any secondhand exposure, it can occasionally occur there too. Um, so as I mentioned, prevention, smoking, you know, stopping smoking. Um, and so there has been for many years, there were, um, there were studies looking at saying, can we identify lung cancer? Because we know that it has a higher risk of death associated with it. Is there a way that we could identify it at a very early stage where we could improve um, cure rates? Uh, for that cancer. And so many things were looked at over the years, and it wasn't until kind of the introduction of uh, using a chest CT, and, uh, and I put there, you can see annual low dose. The, the low dose part of things is, is a lower dose of radiation. So obviously we, you know, when you are doing a screening program, we never want to do, you know, harm. And, um, and certainly as we weigh the, the pros and cons of screening, um, you know, the CT being able to provide a low dose CT that really reduces the amount of radiation someone receives um, is how we screen for lung cancer now. And there have been actually just recently, there was an update on the recommendations. Um, I put the initials there, the USPSTF, uh, which is a task force that looks at uh, prevention and screening and they make recommendations. Um, and they just recently updated to change it just a little bit. And uh, so these uh, screening CTs are recommended for someone who is 
currently smoking or who has quit just in the past 15 years. And they have to be between age 50 and 80 and with at least a 20 pack year history. And what I mean by 20 pack year history, how you figure out what yours is, is we ask how many packs do you smoke a day? So if you say a pack a day and we say, how many years have you been smoking? And you say 20 years, then you would meet that 20 pack years. If it was a half a pack a day and you've been smoking for 40 years, same thing, that equates to 20. So you just kind of multiply those two. But um, I do think this is important. It's something that's available now. Um, it's one of those things that's just slowly taking off. You know, I don't think, you know, there are some primary providers who it's probably routine practice for them to ask about it and refer for that. But I do think it's new enough um, and evolving enough that there's still a lot of times where this may get overlooked. So if you're on and you're listening and you, you know, you're a smoker, you fit into that category, you know, these are great things to bring up with your provider to say, you know, I'm aware of this. Is this something I should be considering for myself as a way to um, screen for lung cancer? Colon cancer, um, it's a uh, cancer of the large intestine. Um, it is the third most common cancer uh, in women. It's also the third most common um, uh, cause of cancer death among women as well. Majority of colon cancers um, start out as a polyp, you know, and polyps, oftentimes when they first start, they're benign. What happens is if they're left untreated, just left in place, over time, they can develop into a colon cancer. And so that's why in part, when I talk a little bit about the different screenings that are available, this is a type of screening that actually you can prevent. Not only are you looking for cancers, that's not the only intent when you're looking at a, uh, doing a colonoscopy, but you're also uh, asking that question or looking to see, is there a polyp there that if the, you know, the doctor performing the colonoscopy sees a polyp, they're gonna remove it. And um, that removal will prevent that polyp from having a chance or opportunity to grow into a cancer in the future. So signs and symptoms of colon cancer can be some of those same things that we talked about for ovarian cancer, where it changes the bowels, abdominal pain or bloating, um, sometimes seeing blood in the stool. So if you see blood in the stool, that definitely um, is something that should be evaluated. Uh, sometimes it can be loss of appetite or weight. Uh, sometimes it can be symptoms of anemia. So anemia means when your red blood cells are low, one way in which you can become anemic is if you had a small cancer there in the bowel that was just slowly bleeding, you may not see any blood there. But if you're found on blood work, but you might be feeling fatigued and your doctor does some testing and they find an anemia, if you're iron deficient, that's one of the things they're going to give consideration to, to say, you know, could there potentially be something within the colon that is causing that? So colon cancer screening, um, this has been updated. A lot of people probably still have stuck in their mind um, age 50, but unfortunately through the years, we have been seeing colon cancers in much younger populations. And so it's now recommended to begin colon cancer screening at age 45. And it is recommended to continue through age 75. And then same thing over 75, there is that consideration for risk and benefits between um, ages seven, uh, 76 and 85. There are different ways of um, screening for colon cancer. And I'll touch on those a little bit just so you kind of understand the differences out there and kind of the, maybe the pros and cons of the different types. So there's different ways where if you're going to try to actually look at directly visualize and look inside the colon, you know, the standard that you would think of the kind of the gold standard, I would say for screening is a colonoscopy. And that's going to look at the entire colon. Um, I have on there every 10 years, and that's going to be someone who's average risk, not a significant family history, and has had a screening, and they haven't found anything. So no polyps or anything. If they find polyps, or if you have a strong family history or other things, the, it could still be that they're recommending more frequently, but that's for someone of average risk, and they've done a, a, a screening, and they don't see anything. Again, usually the recommendation is 10 years. For other types of ways of directly visualizing, because they're not as complete or are somewhat limited with the virtual colonoscopy, that's kind of where they can kind of take pictures. It's a capsule that kind of takes pictures or um, flexible sigmoidoscopy where they're just kind of looking at part of the colon, the sigmoid colon. For things like that, they're recommending, you know, the re frequency for that is more frequent than every five years. And then probably a lot of people have been noticing, I've, I've been having more patients, especially over this past year with COVID, 
who have you know been referred by their primary care doctors for some of these stool-based testing. So for a time, I know it had been very difficult for individuals to keep up on their screenings with COVID. And this was one way that patients were trying to you know, continue some form of testing. So stool-based testing is where, you know, just as it says, they're looking in the stool. So that fit testing, um, that fecal immunochemical test is looking for blood in the stool, that fecal occult blood test, it's looking to pick up uh, blood in the stool. Because um, if there's a cancer in the colon, sometimes it can cause bleeding or small amounts of blood to be there. And that's what those tests are for. As you might imagine, they're certainly not as sensitive or as accurate um, at, you know, detecting cancers as, you know, direct visualization of the colon. That's why they're recommended if someone is having that as a part of their test, it's recommended yearly. Um, the, the last one is one that's kind of become a little more popular. And this is what I've been seeing a lot over this past year with COVID when it was a little more difficult to get in for colonoscopies is where they look at um, for uh, DNA uh, that might be suggestive of cancer, sometimes polyps, but only about 50% of polyps will be picked up on this um, is a test to look at that. And oftentimes when they do this type of testing, they will incorporate that testing for blood. Too. So it's kind of looking for blood, looking for abnormal DNA. And that one is recommended every three years. Again, my bias would be towards the colonoscopy because again, it's giving you direct visualization. It's going to, if there's polyps that are seen, they're going to be removed. And so they don't have the opportunity to grow into cancers. Whereas when you're just doing a school-based test, you're really missing out on that. You're missing out on the prevention part. And if there's anything abnormal on a school-based test, then for sure, then they go to the colonoscopy. Um, and so just to switch gears a little bit, I wanted to touch on just a little bit of when a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, you know, a few things that I kind of, um, you know, that women often will discuss with me about things that are, have become, you know, a little bit difficult. And one is that, you know, cancer, they can affect, as I mentioned, with colon cancer, even you see these cancers that are being diagnosed at younger ages. And sometimes in that age where women are, would be typically thinking about childbearing, so we'll just touch on that a little bit as far as, you know, a woman's ability to conceive after a diagnosis of cancer. And then also some of the things that can affect, um, negatively impact sexuality after a cancer diagnosis. So with cancer and fertility, um, just to mention, you know, cancer is often treated with a lot of different types of um, modalities. So surgery, sometimes surgery, you can imagine if it were for ovarian cancer, you know, removing the ovaries and how that could have an effect. Sometimes it's radiation to the pelvic area that also could have an impact there. Sometimes chemotherapies we give to women can shut down the ovaries. And then uh, endocrine therapies, which is kind of hormonal manipulations, can have an impact there too. So those are all different ways of things that can impact. And so it's very important what I would say for young women, someone who is, you know, prior to menopause, who is looking at a cancer diagnosis, just really important to have those conversations with your provider, because there are a lot of options these days for ways to try to preserve fertility. Sometimes there's medications that we can use um, to kind of protect the ovaries, um, to in, uh, increase the chances that they'll be able to wake up and function after a chemotherapy. Uh, sometimes there are surgical procedures that are done, um, sometimes where they will uh, retrieve um, eggs, egg retrieval prior to receiving any therapy, sometimes where they will preserve embryos. So there's different ways of uh, trying to ensure or preserve fertility. And I think it's really important for women to know that there are ways and things that can be done to try to address this, but it's important to have those conversations early on. You know, once you've had that diagnosis and there's an idea of what the treatment plan is going to be, you know, that should be a conversation then to say, you know, your oncologist really should be asking you, were you planning to have more children? Because some of the therapies I'm giving may have a negative impact. And, um, and then have a discussion about that. And I will say a lot of studies have looked at that and it does appear that it's a very safe thing to do to try to allow do, um, things to preserve fertility for women. Um, and then one, the last thing I'm just gonna touch on is you know, looking at cancer and sexuality. Cancer, um, just having cancer, but also the treatments that we give for cancer 
as you might imagine, some of those things can cause fatigue, which might make it difficult to even think about intimacy, um, reduced libido, sometimes with the hormonal changes that women can experience, uh, vaginal dryness that can occur, um, sometimes mood changes. And also sometimes women just feel different. They feel uncomfortable kind of in, um, you know, in their skin. They're, they may have changed. Their appearance has changed. Sometimes surgeries that um, make them uncomfortable. So all of these things are things that, um, you know, can impact women, you know, as they're going through a cancer diagnosis and treatment for cancer. And what I would say to women, you know, if anyone's listening and, you know, is experiencing any of these things, that there are ways and different things that can be done to address these. And it is important. I know sometimes patients feel like, you know, some of the things that they are going through may not be so important to the doctor, but I would say these are things that are very important to us. You know, we want to make sure, um, maintain quality of life. And, and these are and intimacy is an important part of, you know, relationships. Um, and so I would say, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to your doctor because these are things that we are aware of that can um, occur. And there are oftentimes things that we can do to try to address these things. Um, so just in closing, um, I wanted to just point out kind of like big picture type things that I think are really important. So as I mentioned several times, you know, obesity, that that can be linked to a lot of cancer. So really important to be maintaining um, a healthy diet and a healthy weight, uh, participating in regular exercise um, is really important. Um, if alcohol, I didn't talk about it earlier, but alcohol we do know can be linked to a lot of different cancers. Um, if alcohol is something that you're consuming, really important for women to limit to one or fewer a day. We do know that more than that for different cancers can, um, can increase that risk. Um, know the, know, you know, what are signs and symptoms of cancer, or even if you're not sure specifically what signs and symptoms are, if there's something that doesn't feel right to you or is different, you know, um, keep those lines of communication open with your provider. Um, very important to know your family history. Family history sometimes can be a predictor uh, of your risk, maybe having an enhanced risk of developing a certain type of cancer. So really important to have those conversations with your um, provider as well. And then uh, lastly, again, just an awareness of the cancer screening guidelines that are available, but making sure that, again, you communicate with your provider to develop a screening plan that's right for you. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, Dr. Lynch. That was a wonderful presentation. So much really good and useful information included there that you shared with us. So thank you very much. Um, just want to open it up now um, for any questions that the group may have. Um, feel free to type your questions in the chat box um, if you have any questions on any of the topics that we covered here. Um, I'm not seeing any questions yet, so I'll give you guys a couple of minutes if everyone has some questions to feel free and type those in the chat box. Um, and while you all are doing that, I also wanted to mention, um, typically with these webinars, we will send out some additional information to anyone that's registered so we can share um, some of the information that was shared today, such as the different guidelines for screening so that you have those um, ready at your fingertips and to discuss with your doctor as well. Um, so I do have one question in the chat box here. It says, what is fibroglandular breast tissue? Um, fibroglandular breast tissue would be kind of considered normal um, tissue. I know sometimes um, when you look at that, uh, it's, it's, you know, normal tissue within the breast, they will often comment on mammograms to say scattered fibroglandular tissue. That's part of that density as that, that fibroglandular tissue becomes more dense. That's kind of what you can see on the mammogram. When they say scattered, it means just a little bit there and that it really shouldn't be too much of an impact. But they do kind of rate that and you will see that commented on uh, typically in the mammogram because that's kind of letting the provider know kind of how dense the breast tissue is and what that pattern looks like. Great, thank you. Any other questions before we wrap things up today? No question here, just a comment, just saying thank you so much, Dr. Lynch, for being so thorough and for addressing the sensitive subjects that people sometimes hesitate to bring up. Really appreciated. Thank you. I did see one more question um, pop up in the chat box. Um, when you get a hysterectomy and they take out um, your ovaries, what happens? Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, there was more to, oh, and if you get your tubes were tied. 
Yeah, so a little bit different. Sometimes, and it's important to know because um, a lot of times people will use the term hysterectomy, um, but sometimes there's total hysterectomy, there's partial hysterectomy. So if they're doing a total hysterectomy and they're taking everything, that usually means that they're taking um, the uterus, the tubes, the fallopian tubes that travel, you know, where eggs travel down to the uterus and the ovaries. Um, some, and then the cervix plus minus the cervix. So it's important to know kind of what, if they've left anything behind, it's important to kind of know what exactly they took out because, you know, there is a fair number of time. It might sound like the obvious thing to say, oh, you know, to know specifically what they remove, but sometimes women are uncertain. They'll say, I'm not sure if they took the ovaries too. Um, it is felt that most ovarian cancers arise from the tubes and as well as the ovaries. So that's why oftentimes they will take both. If they're taking the ovaries, they'll take the tubes. That's not usually an option to leave that behind. Um, but what happens is if you're postmenopausal, like you've already gone through menopause and they're removing all of that, it shouldn't really have any effect on the hormone levels. But say they have to remove the uh, ovaries prior to menopause, that actually puts someone like immediately into menopause. So that's where you have ovaries make lots of estrogen. And if those are removed prior to them where they're still functioning, it's kind of this immediate decline in estrogen levels. So then it's kind of going through those uh, symptoms of um, menopause abruptly. Um, when they say tying the tubes or tubes tied, there's different procedures that they can do basically to clamp off the fallopian tubes, those are the tubes, again, that carry the um, eggs down into the uterus. So if they're clamping that or tying them off, it just basically prevents an egg from getting down there. So that's just a way to, um, as, you know, a type of uh, to stop fertility, um, you know, it's a birth control type of thing is the tubes tied, but the surgery is like a hysterectomy, a total hysterectomy is removing all of those parts surgically. Great, thank you for that explanation. Any other questions before we wrap up this health chat today? All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, so just wanted to, again, thank you, Dr. Lynch, for joining us today and sharing all your wonderful expertise. And thank you everyone for joining us. And hopefully you learned something and can take some of this information um, back to your provider on you know, which screenings are right for you. Um, and we hope that you will join us again for our next health chat next month. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.